City Council meeting for the City of Grand Prairie. And uh, I'd like to call the meeting to order. And uh, if you could all rise and stand for the national anthem. Oh, Canada, our home and native land, true patriot love, in all thy sons command, with glowing hearts we see thee rise, the true note strong and free. From far and wide, O oh Canada, we stand on guard for thee. God, keep our land glorious and free. O oh Canada, we stand on guard for thee. I'd like to thank our own local boys choir for this rendition of O Canada. So thank you. And just to start off the meeting, you'll notice that some of the council members are wearing uh, the Alberta Summer Games uh, shirts. And if you would like to get one of these beautiful shirts, it is a volunteer gift. And you're welcome to volunteer until uh, Thursday night. So thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, we are going to talk about the adoption of the previous council minutes, uh, and I'm looking for a motion to go through with that. Ms. Clayton? Thank you very much. That motion is order. We're going to do the adoption. Adoption. I'd like you to go back to the second one, adoption of the previous council committee meetings, the meeting July 3rd. All right, and with that, I'll call for the vote. There we go. And all votes are in. And we have a pass, thank you. We'll move on to the adoption of the agenda now, please. I would move the council approve the agenda with the addition of item 9.2, Art Development Arts Development Committee Grant Berg Sculpture. All right. I'll call for the vote. Mr. Debate. And go ahead. Oops. Sorry. Let's get that go. And all the votes are cast. And once again, we have uh, unanimous, thank you. We have a number of delegations that were, or we have one delegation that was coming today. And at this point in time, anyone who wants to speak to council regarding any matter other than the public hearing can do so. And uh, we have one delegation that let us know they were ahead of time. And that is the Mighty Peace Watershed Alliance. And we have Ms. Rhonda Clark Gothier, Goche. And uh, you've got, uh, we'd like to keep things at around five minutes if that's possible. Thank you for letting me come to speak to you this evening. Uh, my name is Rhonda Clark Gote. I'm the executive director of the Mighty Peace Watershed Alliance. This is Adam Norris. He's the watershed coordinator for technical projects for the, the Alliance as well. So we're here this evening to update you a little bit. I'm pretty certain that. Councillor Thiessen has on many occasions uh, talked to you a bit about what we've been up to as he sits on behalf of uh, the City of Grand Prairie as a board member on our, on our organization. 
Just going to get you to move your mic just a little bit closer. So there you go. Are we good now? Okay. You're good. <clears throat> okay. So we're a multi-stakeholder organization with uh, 21 directors representing uh, a variety of, of seats and broad sectors. So government, including large urban, which is the city of Grand Prairie, and that's Councillor Thiessen sits in that role, Aboriginal communities, uh, non-government organizations, and industry. With a council of, or a board of 21, it uh, keeps us on our toes since we deal also in a consensus decision-making process. As I mentioned, we appreciate that the city has supported with Councillor Thiessen and before that, Councillor Dan Wong, and they have always been active and participants in what we've been up to. The organization was started seven years ago, and we work under the Government of Alberta's Water for Life strategy. So ensuring safe, secure drinking water, healthy aquatic ecosystems, and reliable water for economic sustainability. Part of our work is around policy planning and advisory capacities for various levels of government and industry uh, and those who sit around our table. We um, have completed a state of the watershed on the whole peace watershed. So we cover everywhere from Grand Cache through to high level up into Wood Buffalo National Park and then the Slave River portion into the territories. So it's a very large uh, area of Alberta of about 30% of the geographic scope. When we talk to people in the city of Grand Prairie, they say, well, Peace River is a long ways away. Yes, but everything you do here in this uh, upper part of the watershed truly affects what happens downstream. So the Wapiti River uh, is a, a major tributary to the Peace Watershed. We have done a fair bit of work uh, in, the count, or in the county and the city and surrounding areas here around Grand Prairie, uh, both in a water management plan um, and a few of the areas around Beaver Lodge and Wembley and doing some work there on uh, riparian work, restoration work, etc. So we think that we're trying to cover bases in many ways and of course that all takes money and time. So we're here this evening to talk to you a little bit about where we want to go in the future. So we've done the state of the watershed. We have done an integrated watershed management plan, which uh, we have had many of our stakeholders be a part of. Now it's time to implement those recommendations and move forward on, on the ground work. A big part of what we want to do is education and outreach, specifically water literacy. We have found through our seven years that Lots of people know water, lots of people know conservation of water, uh, but the whole other aspect of water seems to be something we don't think about. So when we talk about invasive species, and I know this council has had to deal with, you know, goldfish in places that they shouldn't be. So when we talk about invasive species, whether they're fish, whether they're plants, whether they're the mussels that have popped onto your boat. Um, so it's, it's educating the public about what we should and shouldn't do. It's keeping your wheels out of the water during especially certain spawning seasons, etc. It's trying to protect our source water. What do we need to do? How do we encourage the public and industry and governments to move forward with recommendations and policies that say, this is how we protect our water source? And I think that there's a tremendous amount of work, not just in the city of Grand Prairie, but throughout the watershed. The population of this watershed is about 160,000 people. I think the last information I read for the city is you're sitting at about 63,000 people as of 2016. And so a large portion, obviously, of our population is here in the city and outlying areas uh, here. So that's why we've come to you first. We have a number of rural municipalities who are supporting the organization. Um, and we are asking that you t consider for us th this evening to help with sustainability of our organization by looking at a four-year commitment of perhaps somewhere around uh, 25 to 30 cents per capita. And you know, looking at that kind of a commitment yearly would be helpful for us as we do our work. Like I said, some of the work that we want to really focus on over the next few years is the education portion, so the water literacy, we are talking about starting up some other projects, such as a source water protection plan and, and helping leading some of those initiatives to, to get a variety of partners together to do that work uh, because it's not something that we can do alone. It is certainly something that we need everybody's help to do. We have a number of organizations and people who give us in-kind support, and that is truly, truly appreciated. 
but we all know that sometimes you do need the money in the bank to, to move forward on some of these things. Our major contribution comes from a grant from Alberta Environment and Parks. Um, and that's sometimes not as timely as I would like it to be, but and we all know how that works, right? Uh, but when we look at how much money we do get, this year our grant is 300,000 from AEP. Uh, we need 260,000 of that just for staffing, for travel, for board or organization, et cetera. So it leaves the money that we can do towards education and projects to be very slim. We always try to work within that and we get other uh, organizations to help us out with a variety of those things. But the extra funding coming from perhaps the city of Grand Prairie would be something that we could truly uh, move forward with in great lengths. We have done a, a fair bit of work with uh, some of your, your city staff over the last seven years, and that has been tremendously helpful, and um, we see a lot of projects in the future that we can work together to move these initiatives forward. Thank you very much. Was there any other things you wanted to talk about or any other questions? Okay, I'm going to leave it up to my council members to ask you some questions now. So, anybody have any questions? All right. Go ahead. Go ahead, Dylan. I just want to make sure I heard the ask right. So, you're asking us to consider between 25 cents and 40 cents per capita with a four year commitment? Uh, 25 to 35. 25 to 35. Awesome. And then, other than so I'm just wondering, are we making any, any contributions right now other than Councillor Thiessen's time and travel expenses and our staff time? Are we making any cash contributions right now? No, uh, actually there are occasions when we get in-kind support. So if we're holding a meeting here, um, often the room space will be donated to us or a, a, maybe a board meeting meal. Um, that's for the most part what we're looking at. Because we're such a large watershed though, by the time we rotate our meetings around so that people can truly see what we're talking about, uh, we don't get to Grand Prairie as often as we'd like to, but it's usually two to three times a year we're here. Uh, next speaker is uh, Councilor Jackie Clayton. There we go. Uh, can you tell me your work with industry uh, education and, and um, sponsorship levels and how, how your relationship with industry is in regards to your initiatives? Industry has been um, up and down depending on who's sitting at the board table. Some of the oil and gas uh, industry have been very supportive in um, either you know a, a, a yearly contribution that, that we can look at. Uh, for the most part, they too are kind of sitting where you are right now and so we're doing the asks of everybody to, to help us come forward with that. Um, industry does, uh, we have a representative from forestry, um, oil and gas, agriculture, and utilities sitting on the board right now. If you know anybody from mining who would be <laughs> willing to sit on the board, we'd appreciate that. But it's, we're, the first seven years we spent a lot of time doing the state of the watershed and the planning portion. Uh, and now we believe we have something that the public and people can grab onto and help us move forward with. So that's why we're coming for the ask for you. Perfect. And if I can have one more. Thank you. Um, can you, in your uh, your document, the state of the watershed document, how far out does um, the document go in regards to um, numbers and, and speculation in your reporting? Um, watershed in 2015, so it was more reporting on historical conditions. We had a baseline. When we go forward, we can see these management practices had a certain effect or not. I have a question. We got Site C over in BC. Uh, have we had any commitment from the BC government to help us, us out in the on the Alberta side, or is that uh, cross-border shopping and we shouldn't ask that question? Um, we haven't had uh, much communication with them. Uh, because Site C being part of the BC government, et cetera, they will talk to other government, which we are not. Yep. Uh, so we can always have an opinion. Whether or not we get an answer is a whole different issue. Um, we do have some friends on the BC side who often will speak to us about what's happening over there and what kind of policies and procedures that they're choosing to move forward with and how that, in fact, will affect our flows and water on this side. But there's been no other formal conversation with us. 
put a pipeline in there, you'll get lots of conversation. Okay. So I was just wondering if there was any uh, on their side with the environmental impacts of this of the both the dams on that river, if they had any done any research projects and and funded you in some manner, one way or the other. They haven't funded us to do any research projects. Um, the group that's doing or was talking about the dam closer to the Dunvegan Bridge has been in contact us with a number of times over the last few years, updating us where they're at and what's been done. Uh, and are willing to share some of that information with us, but they neither have, have looked towards funding for doing that kind of work. Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, we're going to probably bring this up at the end of the meeting and come up with uh, uh, an answer one way or another when it comes to funding, so uh, we'll be looking forward to that towards the end of the meeting. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your time tonight. All right, uh, this is the time if anybody wants to come and address any concerns that they may have. So just come up and take a seat at the, the table here and please introduce yourself to uh, council so we can uh, put you down as being here and uh, all that good stuff. So I'll turn. Hello, my name is Craig Ruther. <laughs> hey, thank you. Uh, hello again, my name is Vicar Minhas. I do apologize to have to keep bringing up this topic, but <laughs> we're here and hopefully you guys got a good ear to this. Well, there's lots of highs and there's lows and when the smoke call clears, we'll all be happy. I yes, I imagine there's been enough conversation around this topic. Um, we're here uh, to discuss the concerns that we had. Well, obviously, we didn't win the lottery um, and we have concerns with the way the lottery went down and the fact that there was a lottery and a limit to the cap to the licenses in the first place. Um, we Initially, the, with the lottery, this was not something that was pro proposed or any business owners or potential entrepreneurs or startups were aware of. Uh, so investments were already made with the understanding that there would still be a set process that didn't involve a cap or a lottery system to actually getting selected to business. Um, I make this point because business is a calculated risk. There is a gamble to it, but it's not a one out of two chance gamble, right? You have foresight, you have a thought on this. So had we known that prior to making these investments that we had a one in two chance, we wouldn't have made those initial investments until we knew the lottery was happening or the lottery occurred. So we're out of pocket, was it, I think four or five grand plus we've already started renovations on the building that we're going in um, and we're just waiting. You know, we have our DPs, everything already in with the city, but obviously we can't get it. Um, and that's a big concern for us. And it's a lot of time, energy, and money that's going to waste. Uh, so with that, uh, and you know, and now waiting a year for that reassessment, you have lease commitments that you have to honor, um, out-of-pocket expenses you have to make without having any revenue to offset or any business income to be able to accommodate that. With the lottery, um, It's, it, I appreciate, and city administration, I, I really feel for them on this, because um, they were, did a lot of work pre, and given what they were tasked with, it was very short timeline and getting prepared for this. Uh, concerns are related to the seriousness of some of the applicants too. Um, you know, with the AGLC stuff, you needed background checks, you needed to put cash up front, you needed all this pre stuff done. Why would the provincial government have these requirements in the city just not, right? It was something you needed a location that didn't necessarily meet any zoning requirements, I presume, or I was told. Um, you needed to fill out a form and you needed an incorporated a company um, and that any anybody could have done that. So you, you could have had, you know, Joe Smith or anybody coming out of the woodworks and saying, I want to do this location here. Uh, and my understanding is there's already people who won the lottery that are looking for locations that don't have it, you know, and there's, you know, you're creating uh, a whole nother issue related to that, um, you know, and then we're stuck waiting, you know, six months before we're even made aware that somebody didn't make the application requirements, right? So before you go down the list uh, for other people that are the rest of the draw. Um, <clears throat> another concern is back to that space is that the, the applications occurred without any committed leases or any committed uh, letter of intents for lease. Uh, AGLC had these requirements. You know, and that goes back to the seriousness of the applicants that were coming in. I'm sure, you know, you get the lottery win and you're going to scramble to get everything figured out afterwards. That's fine and dandy, but there, there's a lot of work and effort and 
done pre that, you know, a lot of people did that didn't get in uh, for these business licenses. Um, and I'd like to speak specific to our location as well. Uh, once again, it, it's to hammer that point to where the only location that actually was looking at east side of the tracks. Um, it goes counter to the objective that city administration and city council put forward, stating that you need to create reasonable access to cannabis retail. Um, the area that we were looking at is that hillside, the east, east side area, and it is a there is a lot of drug issues and that black market will continue to exist in that area if we don't have a retail location. Um, you know, you're forcing a lot of community to have to drive west or south or even north. Um, and on that point, you're creating densities, potential densities in certain areas of the city, um, and you might have certain areas of the city that don't don't have anything. Um, yeah, so it is, I think that was my point, so I think Craig's got a couple too. Uh, yeah, I was just going to uh, kind of, I was curious as to what the whole point of the 15 store uh, lottery was in the first place and what was trying to be accomplished um, because having come to the previous meetings it seemed like we wanted to help uh, keep some local business in the cannabis retail space in the city and uh, there's a few of us here it kind of looks like that backfired so I'm hoping uh, that council would reconsider the whole cannabis lottery in some fashion Actually, on that point too, is you're, you've created a, a legislative advantage for these businesses. Um, you're not creating, giving them incentive. They could open a simple box, meet the security requirements of AGLC, and have no aesthetic requirements. You know, you're creating a false scarcity, uh, and I think that's a big concern because you want these things to look good. You want them to be professionally done. What's stopping somebody from opening a store that looks, you know, that could counter as a pawn shop or a adult store right um, so you have these things that you need to keep in mind that I'm not saying that they will but it's creating that potential and I think that the false scarcity is a big concern with that too so we do urge council hopefully to reconsider it um, and hopefully we can see either the cap lifted or removed altogether removed altogether thank you for your time guys just uh, before you leave we've got uh, an opportunity for council members to ask you some questions so at that point in time, does anybody have any questions? Councillor Piet. Councillor Piet. Thanks, uh, Chair O'Toole. Um, I guess a couple of questions I had, and, and yeah, there's definitely concerns, and, and we're definitely we're going to hear more about it tonight. Was other than the cap or the lottery, was there anything else that you guys with the process that you guys were unhappy with, or or was it just more the lottery side of it? In what regard, like in the, Just, there like was the actually how the lottery went? Or, yeah, so the biggest thing was, uh, I don't think they realized until the ninth or 10th draw um, that there was envelopes being stuck to the side of the cage. <laughs> so, you know, it, 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 if there is an appeal to it, that would be a strong argument or case to make is that not all candidates or not envelopes were laid out or properly be able to picked up on. Um, that was the big thing that really caught me because it was already nine I think it was nine draws I can't I might be mistaken but it was a few draws already in that before they realized that and then obviously it was corrected but um they you know you can't restart it didn't there was no restart or anything on that so other other than the lottery and the cap everything else seems fine from our perspective I guess just a, a comment on you know I can appreciate that people are out signing leases but I mean even without a lottery system there could have been two people potentially signing a lease Hundred yards apart, and one of them wouldn't have been able to get it anyways. If I'm, if I'm understanding what the original process was, I mean, there was still proximity to some things, um, so there was always a risk of signing a lease ahead of time for, for business. And I can appreciate that as a business person, that's you never know, never want the throwaway cost, but I think there was always a little bit of a risk to this uh, for anyone that was looking at it. So um, it's unfortunate that it's you know it's out of pocket for people, but it's it's part of part of business too. So I can empathize with that way, but at the same time, I think that was. I think everybody going in knew there was a, a risk to that as well. Oh, yeah, and the risk, we knew there was undoubted risk because it was something that hadn't even passed federal legislation by the time we were trying to get through, right? Um, but I think have there been actual LOIs put in place, part of that application process, you know, it, it, it adds to, the, um, to it being true to what that is, right? Then you're creating lotteries of people that might be closer and reducing that risk for other people that actually have locations that aren't 
that in that vicinity or in those high dense areas that may occur or those popular areas or whatever. Oh, absolutely, and I, I feel for you guys because that is an area that's kind of sad that we might not have anything in. So, yeah. thanks, thanks for your time. I don't see anybody else asking any questions here. It's just in the queue, so thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, we'll be dealing with the stuff that's happening now at the end of the meeting. So. Perfect, thank you everybody. And once again, if there's anybody else here that wants to approach council, so please come in, do the same thing, just state your name and your concern, and I'll give you five minutes. Good evening, council. Uh, my name is Levon Pearson. Um, I'm also here to discuss the licensing issue. Um, main one was the, uh, I was obviously one of the unlucky lottery uh, applicants. Uh, I was, ended up with the 20th pick. Um, I don't believe any business should be determined by luck. Um, it's a free market, and to put an arbitrary cap on it, uh, it just doesn't seem right. Um, in order to apply to the AGLC, the applicants must have secured a lease. Um, so at this point in time, I was I secured a lease on the basis of the overlay map, and I felt pretty pretty uh, good moving forward with the, uh, my location. And uh, the, I felt like it was a calculated business decision. And come also coming to your question about conflict of stores. I had a clause in my lease agreement that I'd be the only retail cannabis store within the strip mall. So I felt pretty confident that I was going to be good moving forward. Um, I was, I, I'm currently have AGLC due diligence approval since the beginning of June. So it doesn't sit well with me that there's potential applicants who haven't been approved yet or potential applicants who haven't even, uh, apply to the AGLC when you guys are basing all your numbers of applicants for this 15 license cap off the AGLC list and that wasn't part of the criteria to apply. So that to me doesn't seem like a fair, I feel like I was at a disadvantage to the applicants who had nothing to lose because like, like these guys have said, we have big financial investments already um, invested in this business and I have pretty much my livelihood on the line here. So to the fact that the city could potentially pull the rug out from underneath me at this point in the game is uh, really discouraging. Um, I know Grand Prairie itself tries, it prides itself on the entrepreneurial spirit and uh, the free market, and I feel like this is kind of going against everything that makes Grand Prairie great. Um, and to the best of my knowledge, uh, Grand Prairie is the only municipality in Alberta that has put an arbitrary cap on the free market, which is super discouraging. Um, and I know kind of the, one of the reasons for the, the cap in one entity per business was to make sure that local businesses had a chance to set up shop. But looking at the list, at least four or five of them are big corporations from out of province looking to capitalize on the Alberta market, which leaving the local guys like us not having a chance. And uh, for personally, I think it should be local businesses should have been considered first to keep the money in Grand Prairie. and. Uh, yeah, that's, that's mainly my big concerns. And I feel like the city should be encouraging local businesses instead of discouraging them. Um, I'm asking you guys to reconsider the cap altogether, either increase the number of licenses or lift it altogether because it, it doesn't seem right or it's strange to me that Grand Prairie is the only municipality that has put an arbitrary cap on the free market out of all the different cities and towns in Alberta. Um, like in some pl uh, cities did go the lottery route, but it was to determine who was going to be processed first. And if there was two conflicting areas and it was, the, it went to the one who was drawn first, not, and it doesn't seem right that all these applicants now have a chance to run around and try to find a spot. Well, I've been sitting, I'm paying rent on a place and I have a GLC due diligence approval. And I'm ready to go. And now I'm sitting, have to potentially wait six months to find out someone doesn't get approved. That just doesn't seem right or fair. So those are my main points. Fair enough. I'll give you the same. Uh, does anybody have any questions for the speaker? Okay. It looks like you're getting off scot-free. So yeah, once, again. once again, we'll be dealing with this at the end of the meeting. If you want to hang out here right. Thank with you. the cool people, you can do that or you can go home and uh, we'll deal with it. So I have uh, one more opportunity here. I think uh, you're just a chomping at the bit there. So come on up and introduce yourself and... Uh, once again, five minutes, please. It's closer this time. Okay, so I am, uh, I'm Carter Dombrova. I'm the primary representative and co-founder of Canaculture Limited. Uh, I was here speaking at the last meeting. Um, I think you've heard from both the other parties around uh, cannabis and the lottery and uh, the draw that ensued that uh, we believe it was essentially unfair. Um, 
while I have a fairly extensive list of reasons why I personally believe the lottery was unfair, uh, I won't sit here and berate you with those because you've heard most of them from the two people behind me. However, I am going to try and paint a very quick picture for Council. Right now, uh, as a company, my company is composed of two co-founders. Our goal was to hire four to six local people. So that would raise us from anywhere from six to eight total employees. Now, our goal was to hold those employees in Grand Prairie, in the lease that we currently hold in Grand Prairie, which we've been currently paying rent on, with the application that we've already funded. Uh, and we wanted to create a local startup in Grand Prairie with something that we were passionate about. This happens to be cannabis. Uh, and that's been highly scrutinized, but at this point, that's besides the fact. Now, my point is, is that we've put money and time and effort into this, having come from Grand Prairie, born and raised out of Grand Prairie, to be looked at by council and said, look, there's going to be a lottery, and the point of this lottery is to make things fair, but because of this lottery, we're going to remove the people that elected you from the chance to have a retail cannabis store, and rather that, we're going to replace them arbitrarily with corporations and people who are unprepared. Now, I can't speak for the people behind me. However, Canaculture Limited has, uh, has taken part in a deal with uh, the Composite High School to uh, extend our cannabis outreach. Now, this isn't a marketing plan. This is an education plan. See, the high schools don't know how to communicate the effects, especially on uh, youth brain development, of cannabis to their youth effectively so that they'll understand the risks are involved. Now, Canaculture has promised that we will provide the resources to do that to the Grand Prairie Composite High School, and we'd be happy to do that to any other school as well. However, that's not possible if Canaculture does not exist in Grand Prairie, and that won't be happening if Canaculture can't open. The fact is, is that the only option for any company that... Uh, had a stake and chose us to pursue these licenses that wasn't chosen in the first 15 sections of that uh, lottery is to apply for a business license, be declined, take it up with the IPS committee, and fight for an appeal, which, as we know, is set up with three people, I believe, Councillor Friesen, uh, the mayor, and Councillor Blackburn. And I think we can argue that that uh, IPS committee is biased against cannabis as well. So uh, with that being the only option, I would uh, press council to reconsider the lottery completely, and I would also press them to reconsider the cap, as that's an arbitrary cap on the free market. And as far as I know, uh, we're the only city to place one in all of Alberta. Fair enough. Thank you very much. Any questions? Councillor Clayton, you're in the queue. Thank you, Deputy Mayor O'Toole. Uh, first of all, I'll introduce myself. My name is Jackie Clayton, and I chair the IPS. I, from the beginning, was not opposed to the, or is suggested that council put a cap on licenses. I can also tell you that uh, being part of all the IPS meetings, that there, uh, other than one councillor, no one on that committee from the get-go said they were against cannabis. Um, my question to you would be, um, I'm assuming you were an unsuccessful candidate. I think I might have missed that in your introduction. Um, but you have secured a lease and you have done all your AGLC due diligence? Yes, that's correct. As far as uh, being approved by the AGLC, we're only waiting on our development permit in our section from the government of Grand Prairie. Great. Thank you. That was all I had. Okay. I have nobody else in queue. Once again, we'll be dealing with this towards the end of the meeting. You're welcome to stick it out. Okay. So with that, a call one more time. Anybody that wants to come and address council, now is the time to do it see nobody else so we will move on and uh, 6.1 the land use bylaw amendment 1260-93 uh, dash completion of development and cancelling suspending development permits so who's going to right, uh, thank you deputy mayor O'Toole uh, the planning and development department initiated an amendment to the land use bylaw that would add new provisions regarding the completion of development permits uh, as well as cancelling suspending permits. Uh, the uh, the reason for the uh, uh, the addition is that the development officers in working with the land use bylaw uh, determined that clarifying um, the commencement of development and completion of development uh, would benefit developers, builders, and the city in administering the land use bylaw. In addition, uh, the provisions regarding cancelling suspending permits is something that should actually be in our land use bylaw, but it's not. So. Our, uh, our recommendations is that be added here tonight as well. 
Uh, the uh, the amendment uh, does a couple different things. One, it adds a definition for completion of development. Uh, that was one of the things the development officers thought was very important because there there are always uh, there's always um, I guess disagreement or lack of clarity with uh, with builders and developers about what constitutes completion of development, and it adds some uh, some provisions with respect to when development needs to be done, uh, uh, with flexibility for larger scale developments. And then third, it adds provisions for cancelling and suspending permits as required by the Act. Uh, uh, with respect to uh, engagement, uh, initially we brought this up with the uh, local chapter of UDI at a meeting with their executive. Uh, based on com uh, conversation we had at that meeting, we circulated it to both UDI and the Home Builders Associations. They distributed it to all their members of both organizations and, uh, and nobody from either organization actually responded back uh, that they had any concerns. Uh, therefore, we're recommending that Council give uh, this bylaw for second and third reading tonight. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right. Um, we have presentations and submissions. We have questions. Business arising? Yeah. So at this point in time, we do have a question and uh, period. And we have the next speaker is uh, Dylan Pressey. Great, thank you. I just had a question about if a development permit gets canceled, what happens if there's already part of a building in ground and that permit gets canceled? Uh, through the mayor, the, uh, there's a couple different possibilities. It really depends on individual circumstances. Uh, if there is a opportunity for a new development permit for that building to be issued, certainly the city would work with the, de the developer or builder to uh, to basically to to make that happen. Uh, there are obvious, there are likely circumstances where it is not possible to issue a permit, a new permit for the building, and therefore whatever was constructed would need to be removed. Uh, there are certain cases where a permit would be cancelled, but for a use, not for a building, and uh, so a lot of cases the cancellation of a permit would not necessarily affect the building. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. And could I follow up? Follow up, you said. Thank you. So talked about those instances where something might have to get removed. Are there mechanisms in the land use bylaw that actually allow for us to force that or? Uh, through the chair, the, um, the main provisions are in the land use bylaw and they're actually replicated uh, through the Municipal Government Act. Typically it would be in the form of a stop order. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next person in queue. Councillor Piat. Thanks, Chair. Um, I guess my question's more, I can appreciate that, it, you know, you don't want to have projects just loom in and take forever. I'm just kind of curious, do we have a, a history of how often this actually happens here? Like, do we, do we kind of know if this is a one-time thing or this happens five times a year? Um, the, with respect to um, what constitutes completion of development in conversations with the development officers, it's fairly frequent. Uh, where there's you know uncertainty or a lack of clarity about you know does finishing the landscape con la constitute completion, does finishing the interior constitute completion, uh, so that happens fairly frequently. Uh, with respect to somebody not finishing the outside of a building, uh, I think that happens less often, but it is it is a it is a thing that happens. And so the uh, the point of these regulations is to, to create some a me mechanism where the city actually has an, has the ability to do something. Obviously, when we do anything like that, we try and work with the builders or developers uh, to to create a situation that everybody's satisfied. But uh, without any provisions in the bylaw whatsoever, uh, sometimes it's difficult to do that. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. It's okay to. You got another one? Yeah, I just I can I can appreciate that. I mean, from from being in that space, I mean, you you guys are pretty diligent about giving guys reminders. But is that um, is that a normal protocol? Then I guess if somebody was about to expire, would that be something you guys would reach out and say, "Hey, your permit's about to expire. When can we expect this to be completed?" Is that kind of standard? Uh, through the mayor, it's, uh, the development officers are routinely you know, going out doing doing inspections of the of the developments that they issue permits for. And uh, so if something like that was to arise, they would obviously be contacting either the owner of the property or whoever took out the development permit, because often they're different, uh, and, uh, and working with them to you know, make sure stuff is done in accordance with the bylaw. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Halton. Uh, I'll just ask the question one more time. Is there any council members that have any questions? And at that, I see none. So we'll... There's anybody from the public that would like to present uh, at this point in time uh, in favor or uh, come to the table? I see nobody coming. I'll ask one more time. 
Anybody from the public that wants to speak on this particular matter, is now's the time to do so. And I don't see anybody running forward or tripping anybody to get, so they can't get here, so we'll move on. And I will close the public hearing at this time. And we have business arising from this hearing. And uh, then we'll look at some a motion to go ahead with the recommendations that administration has given us. So, anybody want to make a motion? We'll look at this. Uh, Councillor Bissy. Thank you, Chair O'Toole. I would move that Council give first reading to B Law C 1260-93, being an amendment to the land use bylaw. Okay, that motion is in order. There's no discussion at this. So we'll call for the vote. And well, hang on. There we go. Please have patience with me. We've got one more that needs. There we are. We're good. And that passes. Thank you. We will look at uh, this next uh, motion. So I would move that we give second reading to by B law, sorry, to bylaw C twelve sixty ninety three. Okay, and that there is discussion. So uh, if anybody's got questions, now would be the time to ask them. I see nobody in queue. I will go around. Then we'll move on. Uh, let's vote. And that passes. And uh, we'll have third reading. Uh, we're voting to have third reading at this meeting. Uh, we need to have unanimous uh, consent before we can have third reading. So I will uh, move on to voting. I'd make that motion. There you go. So like I said, I'm nervous. I got two very important <laughs> people here. I don't get to make mistakes tonight. All right. So. Councillor Bressy? So I'd make the motion, motion that we have third reading of B bylaw C-126093 at this meeting tonight. Thank you. That motion is good. So I'll call for the vote. And that ma have motion does pass, so we can go ahead with the uh, third reading and uh, go ahead. And I would move that we give third reading to, I can't say it today, to bylaw C-126093 being an amendment to the land use bylaw. Okay. Uh, I won't mock you, and if you don't mock me, we're going to be all right. So uh, any discussion, we're ready to go, and go ahead and vote. And all votes are in. That does pass, so thank you very much. And we will move on to item 6.2, bylaw C-1028E, the Hidden Vellum Area Structure Plan. And I will call that uh, uh, to order now. And uh, I'm looking for an introduction from uh, administration. I think, Dan, that's you again, so thank you. All right, uh, thank you, uh, Deputy Mayor O'Toole. Uh, this is an application to amend the Hidden Valley Area Structure Plan. Uh, the city received this application uh, as it pertains to the northeast quarter 277166, which is the quarter section containing the new uh, Grand Prairie Regional Hospital owned by uh, Grand Prairie Regional College. Uh, the quarter section is approximately 55 hectares in area. Uh, the um, province has applied and had a, an approved subdivision for approximately uh, 22 and a half of these uh, uh, hectares. And the remainder will at some point be turned back over to Grand Prairie uh, Regional College for, uh, for uh, residential and uh, commercial development. Uh, this map here shows the existing area structure plan. It, uh, it includes the hospital construction, campus expansion, and then a mix of single family, commercial, and uh, campus uh, development. Uh, this is the proposed amendment. It looks slightly different uh, in this area. This is a blow up of the area. Um, the area is uh, located uh, just west of 108th Street in Bear Creek. 
Uh, to the north is vacant land also contained in the Hidden Valley Area Structure Plan. The area to the west is the uh, Trader, not Trader, the West uh, Terra Outline Plan. And uh, the uh, development concept for that is on page 17 of the, amend uh, of the uh, agenda. Uh, the area to the south is the Gateway Commercial Area. Uh, we believe that this um, proposed amendment is consistent with all the surrounding land uses. Um, uh, the um, one change that is being proposed here with respect to the transportation network, uh, although the transportation network itself stays the same, uh, this little, where, where I got the red circle, uh, this collector road shifts a little bit north, so it actually continues on into the Trader Ridge outline plan area. When Trader Ridge outline plan was adopted, the road got shifted north a little bit, and therefore this road is shifting up, so it, uh, it actually matches the... Uh, uh, the existing uh, Trader Ridge outline plan. Um, actually, I won't go that far yet. Uh, the um, the east side of the plan area is adjacent to Bear Creek. Uh, at the I will go back at the um, outline plan stage. Uh, the applicants will be required to uh, submit design reports, uh, geotechnical and biophysical reports that will establish the top of bank and a, in a reasonable setback. Uh, as this amendment shows, they are proposing a. Uh, Top of Bank Municipal Reserve that will enhance the amount of green space along the Top of Bank. Uh, they all are also proposing Municipal Reserve within the quarter section itself, uh, approximately in the single family area. Uh, this area has been designed so that the transportation networks as well as the pedestrian connectivity uh, will s flow seamlessly from the uh, 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 West Terra Outline Plan to the west as all, and will also connect to the uh, uh, residential area that's in uh, Hidden Valley to the north. Um, as, as the map indicates, there will be a mix of multifamily, some single family and some commercial uses. When the initial Hidden Valley area structure plan was adopted, this area was all identified for campus expansion. So the, M, the, uh, MD, or the ASP currently says that no municipal reserve at all would be required out of this quarter section. Uh, Obviously, as this is as as this is transitioning to what will be market development, uh, it is appropriate that MR be included uh, as part of the hospital subdivision. The province subdivided off approximately eight hectares of municipal reserve, and uh, the college will be expected to contribute ten percent of their development area. Uh, so, for a total of approximately four point one hectares, uh, we don't know what the exact number is going to be because we don't have the design reports. They will tell us how much ER is required, and once we know that, then we will know how much MR will uh, need to be provided. Uh, this area is impacted by the airport vicinity overlay. Um, there are height restrictions within because of the proximity to the airport, although the height restrictions at this point are actually quite high. Uh, this area is outside the noise exposure forecast, and therefore there's no problem. Uh, this area actually be developed for residential development. Um, currently, this area is zone DC5. The DC5 district was created when uh, we learned that the college wanted to put the hospital on this site. So uh, council adopted a DC5 district, very similar to our PS district, to facilitate the orderly uh, uh, the issuance of a development permit for the hospital. Once an outline plan is done for the balance of the area, then the area can be rezoned to commercial, industrial, and or not industrial, commercial, city, uh, single family, and multifamily, in accordance with the outline plan once it's adopted. Um, the applicant who will be giving a presentation, they did a consultation with all the surrounding property owners. Uh, we, we sent letters out to all the adjacent property owners as well, and obviously the, the public hearing has been uh, advertised in the local paper. Uh, we believe that the land uses that are proposed are appropriate for the area. They are compatible with all the surrounding land uses, and therefore we are recommending that Council give first, second, and third reading to this. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Was there any questions from council? Okay, I have uh, two people. So, Ms. Clayton. Thank you, Council Lucille. I don't know if this question is for administration or possibly the applicant, um, but is there, um, tell me the thought behind the, uh, the MR being in the single family area as opposed to the multifamily. Is that the intent of the applicant or a suggestion from administration? 
uh, through the mayor, the, uh, the, the blob of a municipal reserve within the single family, it, because this is conceptual in nature, it's, at, it's not until the outline plan that everything is really you know, precisely determined. That essentially represents that will be park space within the single family area. Uh, I'm going to, on my screen, go back a couple, well, actually, it's, it's not on, uh, I want to say it's on my screen, it's not on the screen. Uh, within the, uh, my council report, I believe it's the second page of the report, it actually shows the Hidden Valley ASP area and, I've, and directly to the west of it. I've shown the West Terra outline plan. Uh, there are multifamily sites on the far west side of this amendment area. Um, they are adjacent to a large community park space directly to the west in uh, West Terra. Uh, that's why there's no MR within that multifamily area because essentially it's, it's going to be in the quarter section directly to the west. Uh, part of what we do when we're actually evaluating these is we, you know, we, we do things, we, we look at things like that and where are things going to be on adjacent sites. And so the multifamily in the northwest uh, corner uh, is going to be adjacent to a large community park and uh, the area in the southwest corner is going to be adjacent to some storm ponds that have, that are going to have some trails around them, and then further to the west in West Terra, there's more community park, uh, and uh, so that's why there is no MR specifically right in with the uh, the multifamily. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So I'm just going to butt in here a little bit. Uh, what we're looking at today is just the area uh, highlighted in red, and that's the outline of the whole entire area. We're not dealing with the stuff that's inside the red lines right now. Uh, th Correct. Through the mayor, or, or the um, the area that's shown on this map, everything that's in red, everything that's within the red line, yeah. is the area that is subject to these amendments. Uh, if you go on to this, uh, look on the screen right now, the that is the everything that's within the blue dash line. That is the entire area of the Hidden Valley ASP. But there's different owners, so it's only the quarter section at the south end of Hidden Valley that is the subject of this amendment, but it covers, you know, except for the hospital, it covers most of that uh, quarter section. Thank you. Okay, and just to keep uh, the roadways that are suggested there are still up for possibility of changing at this point in time? Uh, Mr. Mayor, the road network uh, was adopted initially. There's, uh, the city did a large transportation study to ensure that the road network in this corner of the city uh, met the transportation needs of this area. Um, and so this air, the, the road network, we don't anticipate changing. Uh, like I said, we, we moved one of these gray lines just a little bit to the north because it was, it was moved slightly in the, tra uh, in the West Terra outline plan. But overall, this road network, which is just the collector roads, there's no local roads, when the outline plan is adopted, there's going to be a whole bunch more roads in this area. Uh, but that road network, we are not anticipating changing uh, at this stage. At the outline plan stage, when developers start issuing or start applying for outline plans and submitting transportation design reports, uh, there may be some necessity for changes to the road network then. We won't know. We don't know now. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I've got uh, next speaker is uh, Weed Plot. Thanks, Chair. Um, I guess my, my question is probably maybe more for administration, maybe the applicant um, we couldn't speak to it later, but just wondering, um, when I look at these plans, I think it, it looks like the highest and best use, and so I, th I like that about it, but I'm just concerned that we, we already have a glut of multifamily sitting around the community, and we're, we're, we're watching these uh, developments just not get utilized, and now, according to this, we'd be adding another 24.71 hectares, so about... 50 more acres of multifamily land. I'm just wondering what we're basing that decision off of. If this was the developer's initiative, and if this is, I, I guess my concern is that we're, we've we've got, I think there was a study done that we've got about 20 years worth of multifamily land underground Grand Prairie now, and this would be adding almost that again on the market. Whenever it does come, I'm not saying it's happening tomorrow, but are we, I guess as administration, uh, not concerned that we might oversaturate how much multifamily we put on the market and potentially how much commercial? Um, through the bear, uh I think the uh, I think certainly the applicant can be uh, can answer part of that question from our perspective. Yeah, I mean at the end of the day, the applicant submits this concept uh, to the city, and and that's what we that's what we bring forward. I think that to a large extent, the uh, 
uh, they believe that the um, the, hosp the construction and opening of the hospital is going to bring about the opportunity and the demand for multifamily in close proximity to the hospital specifically, as opposed to generating, you know, a multifamily site, you know, up in Crystal Lake Estates or something, that there's an opportunity for, for people that are work and live, uh, that are going to work at the hospital who want to live near the hospital, but are uh, in professions that, you know, that tend to rent. And therefore, uh, the intention is to uh, to satisfy the market of, of people who are basically uh, in jobs that are going to be generated at the hospital. But again, I think the uh, the uh, applicant can uh, uh, provide additional input on that. Thank no, you, Mr. Mayor. And I would I would tend to agree with that. I guess I'm just maybe more for clarification from restoration is if this were approved, would it would it change the lens of how we look at potential other ESPs coming through if they had a bunch of multi or commercial in it? Um, just Again, maybe concerned with with just how much commercial and, and multi is is being suggested around the community right now, and what that ends up doing to values of that stuff and, and the amount of absorption, and do we track the, the absorptions of it? I guess more importantly, is that. So I guess my question is: Do we does does the administration track absorption levels annually for multifamily and commercial usages? Uh, through the mayor, I don't believe we don't actually uh, specifically. Uh, I mean, we do a little bit of development tracking as part of the intermunicipal development plan with the county, uh, but we don't specifically do that. I think that the generally the rationale that the that the city has followed is that uh, you know the developers are the ones who understand the market. They understand the need for commercial multi and multifamily uses and multifamily development and. Uh, and uh, they identify, you know, if, if they identify a need in a particular area, uh, the city does not do, say, commercial demand analysis or something like that, 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 uh, that we then apply to applications. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And just la last question, when I look at the overall plan, um, are we concerned about, I know that there's a lot less MR um, within the, the, the college land, I'll call it, mm -hmm. or the, the hospital site, but looking at the two quarters, um, in Hidden Valley about the amount of parks that we'd be asking to put in there. I guess I know they're just kind of dots on there now, but I'm assuming those are all going to be little pocket parks all over when it's running right beside a, a, a Muscacipi trail system and a, and a park system. Uh, through the mayor, the, um, with respect to this particular amendment, because the province came in and subdivided off the hospital and, you know, and some storm ponds, they subdivided off municipal reserve. They didn't provide 10%. Uh, it was somewhat less than 10%. Uh, when the balance of the land that is transferred back to Grand Prairie Regional College, once that happens and they submit their outline plan, uh, they will be providing 10% municipal reserve for the balance of the land that they get back. Uh, with respect to the quarter sections to the north, the quarter sections to the west in West Terra, uh, we fully expect that everybody will be providing the full 10% municipal reserve uh, because this is adjacent to the creek, some of the MR we in, we would expect to be uh, along the creek to enhance that the trail network, uh, and then the balance would be in the form of schools or just you know local community or uh, uh, just pocket parks, those sorts of things. So we would fully expect that because this is a large amount of residential development, uh, everybody would be providing municipal reserve, the full 10% in you know as land. Uh, and you know the, the college is a slightly different case because the province didn't provide 10% MR when they did their subdivision. So, thank you, Mr. Mayor. That's you're good then. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, I'm looking for Dylan, Councillor <laughs> Bressy. Thank you. Uh, just digging into this municipal reserve reserve with us not getting the full share of it due to the hospital. Do you have a, Do you know how? Do you know what percentage of that quarter section of land actually will end up as minutes? as municipal reserve in the end? Uh, through the chair, we don't know the exact number. This amendment suggests 4.1 hectares of MR will be provided. Uh, if the quarter section was com completely kind of undisturbed, so to speak, it might be 5.5, because uh, that's 10% of 55, which is the current size of the site. So at this point, we're, we are expecting approximately 4.1 hectares, like, as I mentioned earlier, we won't know exactly until we know how much of that area is going to be environmental reserve because you subtract that before you do the MR calculation. Uh, so it's, you know, in this area, it's going to be approximately 80% of the MR that we would normally get. And, and again, 
you know, what happened was the call or the province when they subdivided off the hospital and the store and ponds, they did provide some MR along the top of bank, but it didn't represent 10% of the area that they subdivided. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Done. Thank you. And Councillor Jackie Clayton. Thank you, Councillor O'Toole. A uh, couple comments and a couple questions, uh, all for administration. Um, in the big picture of uh, the development here, if this project, for example, the work that's been done to date, were to sit on a shelf um, due to needs of market, um, how long would it take? They take the project off the shelf because there's actually a need for multifamily and um, in the community. How long would it take where they could be to the stage to actually start building a multifamily residential uh, multifamily building? Um, I'm not 100% sure about the question. Are, are you asking us, like, as of today, how long How long would it take? If to today, when would they be ready to go to build a multifamily? I don't mean the individual developer. Mm -hmm. I mean, hypothetically, uh, the property's ready, the infrastructure is in place, et cetera. Uh, an average. Sure. Uh, through the mayor, um, I would suggest, obviously, because this, this is the adoption of the area structure plan, there would be an outline plan process and all the design reports. I would imagine that it might take the applicant uh, nine months to a year to get the uh, all the design reports done and the outline plan in and approved and, that, and then the rezoning. Uh, and then on top of that, there might be about a five-month period for servicing as long as you hit the right time of year. And once the servicing is done, then, uh, then construction. So, you know, maybe... Uh, 18 months, maybe. Theoretically, you could maybe be building in there next fall if uh, if everything lined up and everybody was, you know, sort of super committed. Uh, but uh, developers don't necessarily have, like, an immediate timeline for doing that. And part of the issue with those multifamily sites specifically is they're really deep in the neighbourhood, so you have to service an awful lot of, across an awful lot of empty land in order to get to the multifamily sites. And... Uh, but again, maybe uh, maybe the college can give you a better sense of their timing. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So I guess some of my concerns are is that although I can appreciate the developer needs time to li line things up and there's a process there and, and there's obviously funding process, et cetera, and that it takes a while down the road. But with such a large amount of multifamily currently in our city and, and it's in, um, in the past been a discussion that we wanted to prevent some some level of urban sprawl and when we continually develop areas with more multifamily and there's not necessarily a determined need for multifamily we're taking away opportunities from existing multifamily landowners uh, and creating other opportunities for them and it, it and last term we had and there's been discussions where we have um, pieces of of area structure plans come back to council for amendments and we're planning so far out and i and i'm curious administrations uh, is this truly just to be proactive in regards to this planning? Because if we're going to have to have amendments because these land these lands sit there and aren't used, what's the goal of doing this work so early when there's no need for it? Uh, through the mayor, certainly the um, I mean we the city has adopted a number of area structure plans for areas that are very far out there. Uh, you know, in some cases, uh, you know, such as Bear Creek Highlands. Uh, I mean that area structure plan was adopted 10 years ago, and it you know it might be another 10 or 20 years before its uh, uh, development has actually gotten out to that point. Uh, I think in this particular case, because the hospital was is under construction until maybe five years ago, and and when that hospital was identified to be going there, there had previously been no planning whatsoever that actually said that was where the hospital was going to go so there was no servicing planning no land use planning that sort of thing but given the fact that the hospital is going there it's under construction it will be finished someday uh the um the opening of that hospital is probably going to generate demand for uh commercial development immediately around it in the form of you know doctor's offices labs uh, you know, testing, uh, testing facilities, and that sort of thing, and uh, and that commercial development is probably going to spur some uh, demand for multifamily, you know, uh, in the, in the immediate vicinity. Uh, obviously, the city is, I guess, challenged with the issue of multifamily development. Uh, as council is aware, we've recently changed policy with respect to the amount of multifamily that has to go into an area, an outline plan area. Um, the uh, 
um, I guess our, I guess my message is, is that, you know, at the end of the day, we have, uh, the applicant has identified this, this is appropriate multifamily sites. I, we believe that these are appropriate. This is an appropriate location for the multifamily. From a timing perspective, uh, that's more difficult to say. It, it hasn't been our practice in administration to be saying, well, no, you can't do that because there's no demand for it or there's no demand now. Um, but from a land use perspective, this, you know, this uh, amendment is completely reasonable. It creates, uh, doesn't create any uh, land use incompatibility with any of the surrounding land uses. Uh, and which is why we, you know, which is why we recommend it in favor of it. Um, the other alternative, I guess, would be as, as if councils is um, suggesting that we basically leave areas kind of within the city unplanned. Uh, that creates issues with uh, adjacent landowners not knowing what's going to go in. So, so if where these multifamily sites are identified, if the city said, well, we're not going to plan for those, we're just going to leave those as white spaces on a map, then the surrounding landowners, they don't know what's going to go there, and therefore it's more difficult for them to be planning for the areas adjacent to those areas. So. I guess, sir, um, I can appreciate your comments and agree with them, I guess, and and the plan itself for a usage is is good, in my opinion, from what I can see. My concern is, is when we're building strong communities and we look at transportation networks and transit issues and 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 capacity within our exist, existing city to be to be fiscally responsible with our money in, a, in distrib distributing services across the municipality and we continue to grow in certain directions, it's sort of defeating the purpose of, of utilizing what's there. So that's my concern, but no other questions, thanks. Okay. So I'll just ask one more time if there's any other questions from council members to administration. And I see none, so at that point in time, I'm looking for Hi, my name is Catherine. I'm an urban planner with Stantec Consulting, and with me today is Angela Logan. She's the Vice President of Administration with Grand Prairie Regional College. So I'm just going to pop up this slideshow here. So Stantec has recently been working with Grand Prairie Regional College to establish a master plan to identify through the future needs and aspirations of the college and in the community it serves. This work was done through consultation with students, community members, faculty and businesses. We also analyzed the student population and growth scenarios for the college to, to understand what their needs were for the next hundred years. It was determined that the existing campus has the capacity to accommodate its student growth on the current campus lands. So before you today is a bylaw that proposes to change the Hidden Valley Area Structure Plan. These changes relate to the quarter section of land in which the hospital is being constructed. The lands are currently identified as campus expansion, but also allow for residential and commercial uses. The main objective of this amendment is to remove that campus expansion designation. The result is an area structure plan that will provide for a resilient and complete community that integrates with a mix of urban uses with the existing significant natural system to establish a distinct place in Grand Prairie. A mix of land uses provides for diversity and inclusive neighborhoods. The additional development of single family and multifamily residential are proposed and are a logical extension of the residential lands planned to the north and are consistent and compatible with the lands planned in West Terra to the west. The commercial lands will establish synergies with the hospitals to create a business and employment hub. The plan recognizes the importance of Muscosipi Park, a jewel of this community, and plans for greenways, park spaces, and trail connections to create a network for active and passive recreation spaces. We were thoughtful through the engagement process in communicating with our neighbors early, listening to feedback, and making a changes as a result of what we heard. The area structure plan involves the preliminary design of the city's growth areas on a broad scale. It contains a general land use concept and guides the preparation of more detailed outline plans. Our next steps include further technical analysis to inform the creation of an outline plan. 
We see this area transforming to a sustainable business and employment community hub where Grand Prairie residents can choose to live in a variety of housing types, move around using a range of transportation options, and have different types of open spaces to play or socialize. Grand Prairie Regional College is committed to engage its neighbours and the community through a commun collaborative planning process. This amendment is the first step of numerous planning processes that we have yet to embark on. Thank you. Presenters. I see nobody in queue. I'll ask again. No. Thank you very much. You're getting off lucky tonight. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right. Uh, we'll close the public hearing and we'll deal with business arising from the hearing. And we have bylaw C 1028E, the Hidden Valley Area Structure Plan. I'm looking for someone to make a motion to adopt. And I've got uh, Mr. Yad Minhas. Please look, go ahead. Thank you, local Governor Tool Mayor. <laughs> I'll move the Council give the first council give the first reading bylaw C ten twenty E being an uh, amendment at the Hidden Valley region, uh, Hidden Valley area structure plan. So that's ten twenty eight E. Ten twenty ten twenty E. Ten twenty eight E. There you go. So we're good. So there is no uh, debate at this. So we will. Uh, uh, Take that motion and we'll make it work and uh, go ahead and uh, vote. And display. And that passes. We will move on to second reading. I'll move the council give the second reading to bylaw C 1028E. Uh, there you go. Okay, and with that, uh, if there's any questions or debate, we can have that now. I see nobody in the queue, so I'll take it as we're good. So we'll go ahead and vote. And, uh, and that passes. Thank you. And we'll move on to have third reading at this point in time. Uh, we need to have 100 percent you know uh, ask council to have third reading bylaw c1028 e at this meeting okay and uh once again we'll go for the vote and with that we have 100 percent thank you and uh Give uh, the third reading. So, say third reading. I give council give a third reading bylaw C twenty eight E being amended to Hidden Valley Area Structure Plan. Thank you very much. The motion is in order, and we will go ahead and council. If you want to vote, or even if you don't want to, you have to. And we're good, and that passes. So thank you very much, and uh, that's a wrap. We will move on to item 6.3, and uh, that is the bylaw C-1066-12, the amendment to the Southwest Area Structure Plan, bylaw C-1383, the Stone Ridge Outline Plan, and bylaw C-126089, the land use bylaw amendment. And at this time, I'll call this hearing to order. And if I could have an introduction by administration, Mr. Uh, Reed. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. So the intent of all these proposed bylaws is a simple rezoning from public service to commercial arterial. Um, I just want to note at this point that the uh, Stone Ridge Outline Plan was originally adopted as 
uh, by council resolution, and that is why we have it now that we're adopting it as an ASP, which is why we have an additional motion at the end to rescind, rescind the OP by resolution. Um, the subject property is located in the south of the city off of 68th Avenue and 108th Street. It is adjacent to the East Link Center in the Stone Ridge neighborhood. Um, the site was originally intended for a future college expansion, but as you've recently heard, according to the college's master plan, they have enough land for their 100-year projected demand on their current site, and so a satellite location is no longer deemed necessary. And so the rezoning would allow the site to be developed for other opportunities, in this case, commercial use. Um, public service allows for a range of community uses. This includes recreational facilities, uh, educational centers, and health clinics, among many other uses. Uh, commercial arterial, the proposed use, would allow for a range of commercial opportunities. This includes uh, retail stores, restaurants, car washes, uh, and a long list of other commercial uses. Uh, as you can see, uh, it is directly adjacent to an existing commercial arterial site, uh, and then it is surrounded mostly by residential and other commercial uses. Uh, so it is the administration's opinion that this use is compatible. The commercial uses would support the residential by providing services, and there is no risk, real risk of nuisance because the other adjacent properties are also commercial. Uh, an item that you may have noted in the report is the issue of municipal reserve. Um, it is not currently accounted for in the plan. Originally, the site was going to be a campus, and so it was anticipated that there would be a lot of open space in that plan. However, since that has changed, MR is going to be determined at the subdivision point for this application. Uh, and so they can either request to provide land or cash in lieu, and administration will most likely be requesting land at that point, but it won't be addressed until subdivision for this application. Overall, uh, administration finds that the application is compatible with neighboring uses and re recommends support for the application. Um, and so um, we recommend that council give all three readings to these bylaws as well as rescind the outline plan. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, was there any questions for administration at this point in time? I have Councillor Weed Pilot. Thanks, uh, Deputy Mayor. Um, I guess similar questions to the last one. Um, again, just in that area, there's a, a really high density area of a multifamily. There's two two multifamily sites that have been sitting vacant now, serviced for I think four years. There's three acres of commercial that's been sitting serviced for four years, not started. Um, there's starting to be some more vacancies coming up in South Forty, and I'm just again wondering if we took into consideration that maybe we've got an overabundance of commercial going in this area. When I look at the future growth of Grand Prairie, we might have another 500 doors to go in that whole little corner of town in the southwest. So I'm just trying to figure out where the appetite's going to become from industry to support, which looks like another 20-ish acres of commercial land. So I'm just wondering if administration's thought of that or if this was just uh, planning that was brought forward by the, the landowner and we're just following planning principles. Thank you. To the Deputy Mayor. So... Uh, in first part of the answer would be that yes, uh, this was brought forward by the applicant, and so because public service was no longer required, um, commercial seemed to be the next best use for the site. Um, the issue of whether we make decisions on land use planning uh, in terms of demand would be kind of a bigger picture discussion, especially with the development cycles that we have. It tends to be we have very slow periods and then booms of lots of demand for land. So it is good for us to have a large supply for that period, but we don't actually as a municipality have a strategy in terms of making land use determinations based on land consumption. Thank you. I, I think that uh, administration won't be able to answer those questions, what uh, developers are doing. Uh, so uh, thank you for your questions and thank you for your answer. All right, uh, was there any other questions from council? I see none. Uh, we will move on to anybody that wants to speak in favor of this uh, development or the bylaw changes and come forward. We're just here. I'm happy to answer any questions. 
answer any questions. Okay. Uh, well, they're pretty quiet tonight. I told them to be easy on me here, but uh, I think uh, we're sitting pretty good. Nobody's put their hand up. Nobody's rang in, so thank you for taking the venture up here. Yes. Uh, do you want to answer that question or ask a question? So uh, with that, uh, is there anybody here that's against the uh, changes to the bylaw? I see none. I'll do it one more time. And uh, anybody that's got any concerns, changes, and opposition, we're good. So uh, I'll be looking for a motion. There is... Before we do... Yes. At this point in time, we'll follow the parliamentarians... Uh, we're going to close the public hearing. And with that, uh, we have 13 different recommendations, and we will start at number one. Ms. Eunice Friesen. Thank you, Deputy Mayor O'Toole. I would like to move that, that Council give first reading to bylaw C 1066 12, being an amendment to the Southwest Area Structure Plan. And with that, there's no debate on first motion. Uh, first reading, so we will vote on that. And that uh, passes. We will go with uh, second reading. Thank you. I would like to move that Council give second reading to bylaw C-1066-12. Okay. We do have debate at this point. Anybody have questions, concerns? I see nobody ringing in, so I will go ahead and we can vote and start now. And with that, it uh, passes. Uh, we'll go on and we'll make a motion to have third reading. And with that, it has to be uh, unanimous, so we'll move on. and. Uh, so I'd like to move that Council have third reading of bylaw C-1066-12 at this meeting. Thank you. That motion's good. Go ahead and vote. And that passes. So if we could go on to have third reading. I'd like to move that Council give third reading to bylaw C-1066-12 being an amendment to the Southwest Area Structure Plan. Right. Okay, and uh, we'll go ahead and vote. And that passes. Did you want to take a drink of water before you start on the next three? I'm good, thank you. Okay. So I'd like to move now that Council give first reading to bylaw C 1383, being the adoption amend and amendment of the Stone Ridge Outline Plan. Once again, I'll just make sure that you all understand there's no debate on first reading. So we'll go ahead and vote. And looking for one more. Are we good? And uh, with that, that passes. We can go ahead. So I would like to uh, move that council give second reading to bylaw C-1383. Thank you. That works. So... Go ahead, uh, at this point in time, if there's any debate, we can have that now. I see nobody ringing in, so go ahead and vote. And everybody's in, and that passes. So we're now to have third reading. We have to have unanimous, unanimous uh, vote, so... So I'd like to move that Council have third reading of bylaw C-1383 at this meeting. Thank you. And uh, we'll go ahead and vote. And that passes. So we have the ability to have third reading tonight. And then finally, I would like to... Uh, move that council give third reading to bylaw C-1383 being the adoption and amendment of the Stone Ridge Outline Plan. Okay. And with that, we will call for the vote. Looking for one more.
more. Got it. Thank you very much. And we're on to the next item, number nine. Give first readings to. Right. Uh, so I'd like to move that council give first reading to bylaw C 1260 89, being an amendment to the land use bylaw. Okay. And as stated before, on the first reading, there is no debate. So we'll go ahead right to the vote. So go ahead and vote. And that passes unanimously. So we'll go on to second so reading. I would like to move that council give second reading to bylaw C-1260-89. Okay, and with this, we do have the option of debate. And I see nobody ringing in at this time. I will move on, so go ahead and please vote. And all are in, and that passes. And we have the, in order to have third reading tonight, once again, it has to be unanimous. So, uh, so Thank you. I would like to move that council have third reading of bylaw C-1260-89 at this meeting. Thank you, that motion's good. And uh, nobody's ringing in. I'll call for the vote. And that is passes. We can have third reading, so go ahead. So I would like to move that council give third reading to bylaw C-1260-89 being an amendment to the land use bylaw. Thank you very much. Uh, we will See anybody ringing in, so we'll go ahead with the vote. And that passes. Now we have the last one is to rescind. I'll move that council rescind OP-07-02 being the Stone Ridge outline plan. And that motion's good. And with that, I will move that we go ahead and vote. And there we go. Page one is done. Thank you. That passes. All right. We have uh, the next item is uh, in your agenda is 6.4.4 bylaw C 11863. The Westgate Area Structure Plan Amendment, Bylaw C 1106 8, the Northwest Area Structure Plan Amendment, and Bylaw C 1386, the Westgate West Outline Plan Amendment, Bylaw 1260 96, Land Use Bylaw Amendment. And at this time, I'll call to order. And I'm looking for introduction by administration. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Um, the proposed amendments are to accommodate a new development concept for the Westgate West area. Um, as with the previous amendment application, this one also involves an outline plan that was adopted by resolution. And so we'll need to rescind the resolution one and adopt the bylaw one. Uh, the subject location is on the west side of the city, just beside the airport off of Highway 43. Um, the reason for the application is two parts. The property owners have a new vision for how the area will develop. And also, um, there is a long-term vision for airport access connecting to 116th Street, and they no longer require any uh, other road connections to that access. And so as part of this amendment, we've also accommodated that request from the airport. Um, so here you can see the map from the Northwest ASP. The line I've highlighted in red is the proposed collector road that would be the access to the airport from 116 Avenue. And the two collector connections that I've circled are the ones that are being removed. Now this concept was supported in a previous amendment to the Northwest ASP, however, for some reason, um, the transportation map was missed, and so it was not amended to remove these connections. So that has been corrected here. Um, and so you can see how that translates into the Westgate West outline plan here. Um, those two connections have been removed. Um, 
Additionally, several other roadways have been uh, eliminated. So notably, uh, the one to the west and middle of the plan area has been removed to consolidate one very large parcel. Um, and in the north end, the connection to the airport road has allowed for consolidation of other lots there as well. Um, the proposed change to the development concept um, is largely based on this new road network and allowing for larger scale industrial development through the consolidation of lots and a proposed new lot layout, including the removal of a municipal reserve site. The municipal reserve site was originally intended to be combined with the land to the north and the uh, airport's properties. However, the MR there was removed, and so that vision is no longer feasible. Administration was not able to identify uh, viable use for the site, and as such, um, we are accommodating this proposed development concept, which will allow for more industrial development in the area. Uh, the city will receive cash in lieu for this change. Uh, there are several rezonings as part of this application. Uh, they are entirely uh, industrial uses to other industrial uses, so it's a very minor change, uh, aside from the elimination of the municipal reserve. Um, overall, you can see in the context of the area, uh, it is highly desirable for industrial development adjacency to other industrial parks, the highway, and the airport. We don't see any reason why there would be a negative impact from these uses on adjacent properties and the change to the road network will accommodate the airport's vision and larger scale development which the city is seeking to accommodate. So overall administration recommends in favor of this application and I apologize for the number of motions. Yeah, you went from 13 to 17 here on this one. So thank you very much. Uh, I'll ask uh, council if there's any questions to administration. Uh, so I see none coming up. And your guys are good. So we'll move right on. Uh, is there anybody here to, uh, let's see, to speak in favor of this change, or these changes? Uh, and okay, so hey, we got somebody coming up. Ooh -hoo. So just do me a favor and just uh, say your name, state where you're doing, and uh, go ahead. you got five minutes. Okay. My name is Craig Allen. I'm here with the uh, uh, proposed uh, changes for the, to the SP and LN plans. So we want to first just thank um, administration for all their help uh, getting us to this point and also for uh, council hearing this. Um, proposal put forward. There are developers very anxious to uh, move forward with this and uh, very excited at the same time. So I'm just here to uh, answer any questions if you might have some for this evening. Okay, well, I'll ask. Is there any questions that are for uh, at this time? I don't know if it's just you're a big burly guy and nobody wants to talk to you <laughs> or the report was pretty sufficient. And uh, so let's go with the, the second one. Perfect. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you very much. All right. So at this point in time, I will ask if there's anybody to speak against this, uh, the bylaw changes. I'll ask a second time if there's anybody here to speak against the bylaw changes. I see none. I hear none. So I'll close the public hearing and I will move to business arising. And I'm looking for someone to make this motion, sir. Okay, I have Councillor Dylan Bressy. And uh, thank you, Bressy, I would suggest you take a deep glass of water. You've got 17 of them to make. Well, I wanted 17 tries to correctly pronounce the word, so we'll see if I can do this. Yeah, the V-law. Okay. <laughs> You're speaking, you can say it any way you want. I would give, I'd move that council give first reading to bylaw C-11863, being an am amendment to the Westgate Area Structure Plan. All right, that motion's in order, and with the first reading, there is no debate, so we'll call for the vote. that everybody's in results are and that passes thank you and we'll move on great i'd move that we give second reading to bylaw c 1186-3 okay, thank you 
There is debate at this time. If anybody wants to ask questions, debate. Okay, we're good. I see none. We'll move on to the vote. And okay, it's a little slow, and that passes. I uh, look for having third reading. We need to have unanimous consent, but uh, go ahead. I move that we have third reading of bylaw C1186-3 at this meeting. Thank you. And uh, we will call for the vote. And that passes. So we can have third reading, so go ahead. Great. I'd move that we give third reading to by bylaw C1186-3 being an amendment to the Westgate Area Structure Plan. Thank you very much. With that, I will call for the vote. you got to press the buttons for it to work so all right that passes thank you we'll move on to the next group great i'd move that we give first readings by law c110608 being an amendment to the northwest area structure plan once again there is no debate at uh, first reading so please vote and that passes I would move that we give second readings by law C110608. Thank you. Uh, any questions, concerns? I see none. No one's ringing in. Please vote. And that passes unanimously. Uh, have third reading at this meeting. We have to pass unanimously. So go ahead and to see if we have third reading tonight. I move that we have third reading of bylaw C110608 out of this meeting. Okay, that motion is good. We'll go ahead and we will vote. And all in. Thank you very much. We can have third reading, so go ahead. This is awesome. I've got stats of losing a lot of votes and this is bad in them. Yeah. This is great. Give third, I'll, I'll move that we give third reading to bylaw C110608, be an amendment to the Northwest Area Structure Plan. Thank you very much. And uh, we'll go ahead and we'll vote. And that passes unanimously. We'll move on to the next set of bylaws. Great. I'll move that we give first reading to bylaw C 1386 being an amendment to the Westgate out West outlined plan. Okay. Once again, with first reading, we do have not, we do not have debate or, okay. So we'll move on, go ahead and vote. And that passes. We'll move on to second reading. I'd move that we give second reading to bylaw C-1386. All right. We do have debate at this one, if required. I debate me, help my stats. I, I see that we have no one in the queue here, so we will move on. Go ahead and vote. And that passes unanimously. Uh, to have third reading tonight, we lean the motion, uh, but we also need to have unanimous. So, Great. I'd move that we have third reading of bylaw C-1386 at this meeting tonight. Thank you very much. And we will move on and go ahead and vote. And that passes. We can have third reading at this meeting. Great. Well, then I'd move that we give third reading to be bylaw C-1386 being the adoption amendment of the Westgate West Outline Plan. Okay. And go ahead and vote. And we have unanimous, and that passes. So we're on to item 13, which is uh, the last of the four. So go ahead. Great. I'd move that we give first readings bylaw C-126096 being an amendment to the land use bylaw. Right. With first reading, there is no debate. We'll move on to the vote. And 
that passes. So we'll go on to second reading. I move that we give second reading to bylaw C-126096. All right. There is debate here. If anybody wants to ring in, I think you're getting away pretty lucky here, Dylan. So uh, nobody's ringing in. So we'll go ahead and vote. That passes unanimously. To have third reading, we need to have a unanimous uh, uh, pass here. So go ahead, make the motion. Great, I move that we have third reading of bylaw C-126096 at this meeting tonight. Okay, call for the vote. One more, there we go, thank you. And that does pass. We can move on to have third reading at this meeting tonight. Great. Well, then I move that we give third reading to bylaw C-126096 being an amendment to the land use bylaw. All right. And with that, call for the vote. And that passes unanimously. Thank you. We've got one left, and that is to rescind. So you want to make the motion? Well, finally, I'd move that Council rescind OP0705, being the Westgate West outline plan. Thank you very much. And any questions, debate, we're good. Nobody ringing in. I call for the vote. And that is passed. Thank you very much. It's the most you've talked in a meeting for a long time. I don't believe that. <laughs> in one time. <laughs> I'm just trying to be a nice deputy mayor. Yeah. Just. I don't have anybody here to stop my feet down here. Okay. Yeah. So we are at. Where are we at here? Unfinished business? So our next item on the agenda is unfinished business. We have none at this time, and there are no reports uh, submitted to this council meeting. So we'll move on to committee business, and we have community living committee meeting held Tuesday, July 3rd, uh, this last year. Uh, and I understand, Councillor Bissey, you are going to read that report. Well, thank you. So I'll, I'd move that Council receive the minutes of the Community Living Committee meeting held Tuesday, July 3rd, 2018, as presented. Thank you. And anybody find any flaws or concerns with that minutes? Okay. So then what we'll do is we'll call for the vote. All votes are in. Thank you. And that passes, so we're and good. And if I may speak to the meeting. Yes, if you have No business comments. came out of the meeting to bring to council, but it's community living is always fun because you get to start it off often by hearing reports from partner agencies that were part of funding. And at this meeting, we got to hear from HIV North, who's doing some great work with their LGBTQ youth group. I know firsthand that that's doing great work for some of our kids in our community. We got to hear from Odyssey House, where... We help fund a program that helps them recruit volunteers. And I love that we're not just funding their programs directly, but we're funding them, raising some social capital in our community. So that was really fun to hear about. And finally, we got to hear from the Society for Pregnanting, uh, Pregnant and Parenting Teens. And it was fun to celebrate some of their successes, um, including the fact that they, including some report, some awards that they've been that they've been given recently. So this is a society that's done not just great work in our community, but they've been recognized outside of our community for it. So it's exciting to hear from these groups. Thank you very much. And Sorry, and then finally, the last thing that I want to report is I'm just trying to bring it up on my, on my tablet. But the other thing we got to hear a report on was the city's initiative to end homelessness, which isn't a work of the city, as we all know. It's a work of us and a whole bunch of other agencies and caring people in our community. And many of us got to go to the presentation at the Montrose Cultural Center he to hear more about it. But the one stat that I want to draw Council's attention to was in year one of the program, which was 2015 and 16, there were 13 program graduates. And now two years later, in the following year, there were 60, 61 program graduates. 
So I think that's that speaks to both how long it takes to work with some of these people to find positive solutions to them, but also with how good a job of our, our staff and our partner agencies have done finding solutions that work. So it's exciting to hear some of our successes. At the same time, I think we all know that we've got a lot more work to do in this regard. So I want to thank Council for starting the work of a housing development corporation a couple of weeks ago and for your continued support of helping find everybody in this community a home to live. Thank you very much. So we have no other reports. We do. Oh. Yeah, the item. It's okay. Oh, that's right. The Jackie's. Okay. So if you remember the agenda amendment, 9.2, Councillor Clayton, did you want to bring that up? The Grantberg structure or sculpture? I'm, I can make a motion if you'd permit me. Oh, yeah, sure, that works. Thank you. Great. I would move that council approve the purchase of the sculpture windswept from Grant Berg in the amount of 9000 exclusive of GST and to fund this from the public art reserve. And just to speak to this for anybody watching that that wants to know is this is the sculpture that appears on 100th Avenue just west of downtown in the middle of the of the boulevard. It was made a few years ago. It was mostly funded by the art by the artist along with a $1,500 grant from the city. And in recognition of that grant, the artist lent it to the city for a few years to be on public art display. And I was saying, all right, that, that loan is over. I want to decide what to do with it, and I'd love to sell to you guys if you want. The Arts Development Committee took a look at this, and they think this would be a great piece of art for the city to own. And there's also been a funding source identified, which is a reserve set aside to purchase public art. So where you've got the ability to buy it without having any tax implications or any service implications. So it seems like a great purchase to me. And then part of what will happen is if we do buy this piece of art, then going through the community living community will develop, will look at where is a good permanent home for this piece of art. Thank you. So at this time, I'll just call if there's any questions, concerns from the council members here at the table. If not, we'll go ahead and we'll vote. I see nobody ringing in. Thank you. And go ahead and vote. And we have, looks like we're going to go ahead and buy that piece of art. Thank you. So we had no letters of correspondence today. Uh, we need to deal with the delegation business. So we had two delegations, the piece uh, water elation and we had some people that come to the counter within the cannabis debate so anybody looking to make a motion for the peace watershed Go ahead. Wait. thank you Mitch mr. Pilot I would just make a motion that we accept their information uh, report for information to the appropriate standing committee which I would I guess is corporate services that uh, for funding um, just to look at for this budget year. Okay. That motion is in order. And we will go ahead. Any other debate? Okay. Accept or refer? It's, yeah, it's probably refer to, not accept it, but refer. It will, it will go back to IPS. Yes, yeah, sorry. Yep. Okay. So we can deal with that through administration. And uh, we'll get them on the schedule as soon as we can, I guess. So with that, uh, we will make that motion. And it has been made. We'll vote on it. And it looks like that's coming back to IPS. We do have one other item that uh, we thought we would debate. Uh, we had people concerned, three different groups. And anybody want to make a motion on that? And we have Councillor Jackie Clayton. Thank you, Deputy Mayor O'Toole. I would move that uh, Council um, send the, the oh, hang on, I gotta think about this. That um, Five minutes, just like the speakers, just saying. Well, I got three pages of notes here, so I'm just trying to think about it. I uh, know, um, uh, I would move that we send the information presented from the delegation today to the appropriate standing committee discussion at the next IPS committee meeting okay. which would be August 7th okay thank you very much I'm pretty sure we may be able to make some room in that meeting for that for sure and uh, any questions concerns d debate I see none no one's answered a lot 
Uh, thanks, Chair. Too. I'm just I would support the motion. I'm just wondering if it's possible for um, the next IPS meeting if maybe administration can let us know if there's been more applicants come in. I'm just kind of wondering. We were kind of we thought it was around 20, and then it ends up being 30. And I'm just wondering if there's still more coming in because that might impact my thoughts on it. If there's 40 or 50 potential applicants now, or however many have, have come in. Um, so just some thought from my. Thank you very much. Uh, see nobody else ringing in, so let's go ahead and vote. All votes are in. Sorry. Hey, they're here. Go ahead. Thank you, Councillor O'Toole. Um, we can circulate an email in advance to IPS committee with the current stats uh, in terms of uh, number of applicants and um, the results for the um, 15 uh, um, successful applicants as well uh, for information to council. I don't know if that changes your vote or not. But... You're not going to hold that against me, are you? <laughs> Never. Okay. All right. So we have... Uh... No notices of motion. Too fast. Too fast. Did I catch you? Okay. Okay. There are no notices of motion today, so we will move around to council member reports, and we can start with uh, Mr. Pallott. don't have any external uh, committees that I went to other than I just I did want to speak that one of the events that I went to was Golden, uh, Golden Aid Center Board of Directors and I found it interesting and uh, a few of us started scheming about what a great property that is uh, as they're saying that they might want more space and just uh, what a beautiful spot that is right along Muska CP I never really realized how nice it is on the, the west side of that uh, property when on the walk outside that you're right over the corridor so just lots of potential with that, that property okay and Anybody else have a council member report? Committee member? All right. Okay, we'll move on to round table. And Eunice, if you'd like to start. Thank you, Deputy Mayor O'Toole. <clears throat> uh, I was going to speak to the homelessness report, but Councillor Bressy did so. So I'm going to take a uh, the opportunity instead to just shout out what a wonderfully vibrant arts community we have in Grand Prairie on uh, Friday night, July 6th. I actually attended two openings. One was Show Us Your Colors at the Center for Creative Arts and the other was at the Art Gallery and that was a show called Memory Landscape. And I often hear, and I am so proud to hear it, that Grand Prairie has uh, a lot of hidden gems and just a really active arts culture. And I deeply enjoyed that on Friday night. Thank you. Mr. Clayton. Well, we're going to go this way. Okay. Councillor Bressy. Great. I like the mix up. We don't know when it's going to land on you. Keeping you awake. I think the. Uh, one that I do want to point out was I took a wander through the art gallery recently, and there's a great exhibit there called When Raven Met Spider, which is uh, which is an imagination of, of our classic superhero tales mixed with indigenous culture, and it is a fascinating look. It is, I went in there individually and read a bunch, and then I took my kids, and it's something that, take kids and also go on your own, but it it's fascinating. It's there till mid-August, so if you haven't checked it out, check it out, because it's one of the coolest art exhibits that I've ever personally seen as a comic book geek. All right. That? You're, now you want to talk? <laughs> Jeez. Okay. Miss Jackie uh, Clayton. I want to remind people that this is a great exhibit. It's a great exhibit. I can tell you that every hotel is full in town. Um, and as we prepare, uh, just sort of keep in mind when you run into people on the street, uh, if they ask you where, you know, be let's be extra friendly than usual Grand Prairie. Uh, friendliness, help people if they're lost, hold the doors open, 
be, uh, you know, be as accommodating as you can when, when the traffic may be even more intense than usual. So I encourage everyone to get out and watch some activities and, and support the games. And in addition, the downtown street performances this weekend starts Thursday, uh, 4 to 10.30, I think, 4 to 10 the first night, and four to, and uh, 11 to 9 the next night, approximately. Don't quote me on that. But uh, uh, And it's in its new location, so not in the traditional downtown. It's on the new streetscape, so it'll be an opportunity to highlight the work that we've done downtown. So I encourage people to get out and check out the sports activities as well as some cultural events. So it's a great combination of sport and culture in our community this weekend. And I encourage people to get out and enjoy it. Thanks. Thank you very much. Yes. Uh, I'll just speak a little bit. I've been filling in for Mayor Given. Uh, over the last week or so and uh, looks like I'll be doing that for next week as well. It's a pretty busy schedule and uh, I do want to thank everybody supporting me today to fill in this chair while he was gone and a few minor glitches here but it's uh, it's all good so uh, enjoy the warm weather. I understand we're going to have warm weather till Friday and then we're going to have a little moisture to cool you down but uh, with that I'll call the end of the meeting so thank you. Yay.